Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in the North Tent on this sunny afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here with Rachel and with Carolyn. And very quickly, before we get the panel going, um, I got instruction that I was going to introduce myself. So I'm a stand-in moderator. Um, this is the first of two, I think, exciting workforce sessions. The one today with um, Rachel and Carolyn, and then tomorrow I'll be joined uh, with my Google colleagues uh, thinking about workforce innovations, and uh, hopefully some of you will join us tomorrow as well. So I'm Tracy Palangin. Um, I have the pleasure of running a very funky nonprofit called Social Finance. We are a national impact investing, impact finance organization, and we think about blending different types of capital to finance new models for social change. And in particular, we're doing a lot in workforce finance, and it's a really, really exciting time to be innovating in this space. But for this session, I could not be more delighted to be joined by Rachel Romer Carlson and Carolyn Childer. Chowders, uh, both amazing entrepreneurs, both um, founding woman-led unicorn companies, and both uh, working really hard to think about what does it mean to deliver skills-based education and new career pathways for folks, as well as creating the kind of mentorship and coaching and networks uh, to enable upward mobility, especially for women and people from underserved communities. So today we're going to have an exciting uh, conversation, not least Rachel and Carolyn founded the companies before the pandemic in a very strong economy, in a very tight labor market, and then we had the last two years and we learned a lot about the needs of a modern workforce, we learned a lot about the evolving relationship between the employer and the employee, and I am just really excited to hear how Rachel and um, Carolyn are thinking about their businesses amidst that backdrop, but also in a new macroeconomic reality, which is rising inflation, still a tight labor market, but uh, most likely um, an impending economic um, softness, downturn, recession. I don't know if I'm supposed to say these scary words, but before we get into it, um, level set for us. Rachel, may I start with you? Tell us about you, tell us about Guild, uh, what inspired you to found Guild in 2015, and how's, how's it going? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Rachel Romer Carlson, and um, CEO and co-founder of Guild. And we are in the business of distributing opportunity to America's frontline workforce with partnership from their companies. So if you've heard how Chipotle, JP Morgan, Walmart pay for their employees to go back to college, we're the back end infrastructure of that. The payments, the data, we're also the marketplace. We've curated 140 universities, over two, uh, sorry, 2,500 programs at this point, everything from high school completion and English as a second language to data analytics, digital marketing. So that layer, the learning marketplace, and then uh, coaching and career services. We have 400 coaches on our team, as well as career um, uh, advisors who are helping every employee, uh, 5 million that we represent today, uh, figure out how do they want to advance in their education and career. And, and you know, when I say frontline workers, that's a term not many folks used in 2015. Uh, in the pandemic, we all became intimately familiar as we celebrated those frontline workers, our hospital employees, our retail workers, our restaurant workers. Um, but that's really why I do this work. I come from a family that I joke is sort of an A-B test on education. One side of the family, everybody went to college. The other side of the family, very few of us went to college. And, and my view on my cousins, 45 of us across the two sides, is that the really only difference between um, those of us who've had the opportunity to start companies, to have children on our own timelines and start families, to have a lot of economic freedom and personal freedom, the only difference between where that's gone well and where that's been quite complicated has been uh, the opportunity to take advantage of post-secondary education. I, I'm not a college for all, um, but certificates, credentials, college, and the opportunity to have a knowledge economy job has been the difference for, for my cousins and I. And so that's what inspires me to do the work. Well, we'll have a chance to really ask a lot more questions about Guild. Um, but before we move there, Carolyn, tell us about Chief. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Carolyn Childers. I am the co-founder and CEO of an organization called Chief. And Chief is a um, 
vetted network that's really focused on senior executive women, really under the mission of driving more women into the positions of leadership and keeping them there. Um, we started in 2019, so we're still a young organization, um, but we have about 15,000 members across the US really focused on women who are VP level and above, um, building a community for them to be able to tap into each other to answer their biggest professional, personal challenges, a lot of um, coaching, whether it be peer coaching, executive coaching, we have 400 executive coaches that we work with, um, and a lot of it, 70% of our membership is sponsored by companies themselves. I think a lot of companies have made big statements of wanting to drive um, more women into their positions of leadership, more diversity um, into positions of leadership, and uh, an organization like Chief is really a great way for them to invest in their senior talent of women. So before we talk about the macroeconomic backdrop, let's, let's just make it very tangible. So I'm a frontline worker at Chipotle. What is the status quo uh, in terms of opportunities in front of me? And what does that, how does that change with Guild's offerings? Yeah, so uh, Chipotle is uh, both edge case exception to that question and a really fun one because I actually firmly believe, in fact, we just wrote an article um, with their chief people officer. Well, excuse me, Fortune wrote an article. We contributed to it. I think Chipotle is the fastest job to the middle class. If you meet somebody who is a ambitious, low-income American and they say to you, how can I get to a family sustaining wage? How can I have economic freedom? My answer to that person when a Lyft driver or an Uber driver asks me that is go work at Chipotle. And that's because Chipotle promotes 95% of their employees from within. Um, and when you run a Chipotle store, you run a uh, $2 million p and and you make six figures. The challenge is Chipotle's always had a hard time figuring out who to promote from within. And they had L&D programs that people historically- What's L&D? Oh, thank you. Learning and development programs um, that the mandatory ones people did and the voluntary ones people were unsure and didn't opt into that often. And when we started working with Chipotle, what they found was that their employees who were opting in to our broader education suite, these weren't company trainings, these were bachelor's degrees from well-known universities, these were high school completion programs, uh, college prep um, certificates, people management, it's actually our most popular um, short-term certificate there, it's about a six-month program. Those employees became their prediction or their predictive tool said those employees were the most likely to be successful as leaders of the organization. So today, if you're a guild learner, uh, at Chipotle, you are 7.5x more likely to be promoted on the job than the employee with the same title right next to you who's not learning. And so it's become a very powerful signal within their business um, of skill and aptitude and interest in the, in the desire to grow. So that's the difference, is employees are using the skills they're gaining to grow. But that was rooted in Chipotle to begin with. They were just figuring out how to institutionalize it where we're driving even more transformation are companies that historically haven't been promoting their frontline workforces and are realizing that the people manager they're looking to hire already works for them. They work in their front line. And so we're helping companies really transform of thinking about how do we grow our own talent versus merely attract. Yeah, that's hugely important because as you know, the great resignation was about like I think two thirds of employees leave because they don't see advancement opportunities and having more Chipotle's um, in the world, both in terms of a corporate culture, but also actually having the real tools to make it happen uh, with a guild suite uh, seems a wonderful combination. Carolyn, take us from the status quo to kind of, um, if I'm a woman VP at a company, what, what do I have around me to support me versus in, in, a, in a world with chief? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it is both people who are in the front line and people who are in the executive levels who are continuing to look at company cultures and say the thing that makes it a great culture is the opportunity to still learn and grow. So I don't think that that is unique to any one level, um, and that's really where we start to focus is at a more senior level, focusing, like I said, on women, driving them into positions of, of true leadership and keeping them there. Um, but I think what is really uh, at the forefront of, of it for women is that they are often just the only in an environment. Um, and so the opportunity to actually have a community around you, to be able to have like true authentic conversations about what your challenges really are from a lens that um, 
allows you to have that vulnerability and work through that, that is honestly the biggest thing that Chief really provides, is that opportunity for people to come together to share their learning, to be able to normalize things that are happening. Um, and uh, a lot of times it's very hard to do that within the context of the company, um, given the lack of representation that exists in some of those senior levels. Um, so as much as uh, there might be a little bit more of the hard skill that you're getting in something like Guild. A lot of what we focus on is um, how does the community and our coaches and the peer come together to really just talk through a lot of the still people challenges and the soft skills that you need around those people challenges. I, I honestly think that is like the number one thing everybody is struggling with on a day to day is the people challenge. Um, and that's really what we're able to tap into and provide for people. Terrific. So let's move to how companies are thinking about these investments, whether it's Guild or Chief. Um, knowing that the economy is going to get softer, are they rethinking these kinds of investments? Or do you think that the pandemic has taught us so much and um, companies, like companies for decades have been just consumers of talent. They rely on some system out there, largely our Title IV system, post-secondary system, and it delivers talent, companies hire them, and voila. Here, they're saying, you know what, that might not work for us anymore, especially with 11 and a half million unfilled job openings around the country, that they actually need to invest in the workforce, upskill their own workforce, and not rely on, passively on some outside system. But um, the last 11, 12 years have been a wonderful market. Um, and, and with the softening, are you seeing different behaviors from your corporate customers? Um, you know, on, on our end, not particularly, but for a few reasons um, and some important averages. So, you know, the um, one of the biggest growth areas for Guild right now is in the healthcare space. Healthcare is not a recession-driven business. In fact, their labor shortages have been magnified over the past two years and will be untouched by any, and unfortunately not solved by any slowness in the labor market. Um, additionally, our employ the employers we work with, especially the enlightened ones, tend to think about the work we do as an investment in their business. And what I mean by that is we do a lot of work to show that the return on investment in a dollar in your employee's education yields two and a half to three dollars back to the business. And so, uh, you know, there's the, the horror stories of 2008, 2009, where learning and development budgets get cut, where coaching and, and those sort of employee, uh, let's call it perks is the word people used to use, get cut. Sure, um, I think we're in a very different conversation right now in the United States about what an employer is expected to give employees. Now, does the balance of power shift in a recession? Sure, um, but I mean, I don't know if y'all saw the article a couple weeks ago that said Amazon has, there's a memo that they wrote that says they might run out of talent by 2024. They might run out of talent in markets where they have worked through every available warehouse worker in those markets. And I don't think immigration policy, unfortunately from my vantage point, is gonna change in the United States anytime soon. So if that doesn't shift, the frontline workforce is a massive issue with one open job for every 0.6 workers we have. And a recession might impact the company's balance sheet and they might just not hire at all, but we're still not gonna crawl our way out of that problem in manufacturing, in healthcare, in industries that still need to grow. Yeah, it's a deeply strategic challenge, and that's why companies don't really see this as an expense. It's a really long-term investment. So what about you, Carolyn and Chief? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's just been a general macro shift where it used to be that the you know uh, major IP of a company was like what they were building. It was like what you were manufacturing. It was the goods. Now it's the people. And I don't think that shift is ever going to go back. It is still about the people. And so I think even if you are in a place of a recession and some things are starting to pull back, I actually think it's a moment where people will need to invest even more in the talent that they keep. Um, that there is a real need, you're asking more of them as individuals um, to take on more responsibilities as you're not able to hire as quickly. Um, you are needing to make sure that your top talent is really staying with you for those reasons. That I do think that there will be a, um, you know, and I think you're starting to see people are looking at, you know, the pace of hiring in certain industries, particularly the tech industry. Um, other, other industries are still hiring like crazy and can't fill seats fast enough. But in things like the tech industry, yeah, you're starting to see that pull back. 
but I still think the investments per employee become even more important because you need to ensure that you are keeping your top talent and that war on talent is not going to not going to end. And it's really tricky right now with everything that people are trying to decide between, between you know, um, remote work versus being forced to go into the office. Um, I think one of the things that is most consistently able to be done universally is I need to just find ways that I can show you that you are somebody that I value. And this investment of how do I continue to give you access to learning and growth is the number one thing that people are looking for. Totally. Let's switch gears to a kind of broader societal challenge, which is our stagnant economic mobility. Um, the economist Ross Chetty has wrote famously that if you're a child born in the 1940s, you have a 90% chance of out-earning your parents. And then a child today actually has only a third chance of out-earning your parents. So this idea of the American dream is very, very quickly eroding. And as I listen to you, and as I think about upward mobility within the guilt sense, and then all the supports that you provide at Chief, how can you imagine a world where a woman starts on the floor of Walmart as an hourly worker, works her way through the system, and then becomes a member of Chief? How do we enable that to happen at scale so that it's more? And I, I think about this, like Doug McMillan and John Ferner, both of them started, this is the um, CEO of Walmart and then the guy who runs US operations, both of them started as hourly workers on the floor, rising to the top. How do we enable more of those stories so it's not so deified? I, I love that <laughs> question because it's how do we make the American dream the rule, not the exception, because it's become the exception to your data and so many other data points. Um, you know, when we look at what's holding back highly talented, highly ambitious folks who happen to be born into the zip codes that Raj Shetty studies, right? We know that the zip code you, that you're born into is the number one predictor of the likelihood that you'll go to any post-secondary education, the likelihood of the job you'll end up in. I don't think any of us think that's fair. And I think we all know that talent is equally distributed amongst every zip code in this country. There's no um, like monopoly on that. It's that opportunity is not equally distributed amongst zip codes. And so when we look at the equitable distribution of opportunity and what does that take uh, through Guild's lens, First, we know you have to take money off the table. And I'll, um, I'll give an interesting little nugget there, which is uh, college feels cheap in lots of places these days. Now, it feels very expensive if you look at US News and World Report and the New York Times, it's $60,000 at what have you schools. But in many states, it's two, $3,000 to go to a community college. Core challenges are, one, that community college likely has a 5 to 10% completion rate. So 90% of people who walk in those doors don't get what they paid for. And two, if the average American had less than $400 coming out of the pandemic or wherever we are in the pandemic in their banking account. So if you have less than $400 for when the car breaks down or when your kid gets sick, you don't have $3,000 to go to college. And so the top thing we found is that you have to truly give a debt-free path to education for uh, the employee. Now, we don't have to debate Bernie Sanders' policies on free college right now, because guess what? Employers are willing to pay. So there we go. So employers can pay for the worker to go back to college. That's the top thing. The second thing is being really thoughtful about shame. We have told so many of those folks that 90% of population that's walked out of community college, we've labeled them dropouts. In what other environment do we say, oh, 90% of customers don't like the goods. It's their fault. Right? Like, and, it, and I love community colleges. I worked in them for many years. And, uh, but at what point do we say, oh, maybe we built a dropout factory. Maybe we should remodel the factory. And that's what we're aiming to do, is figure out how do we build the other systems. And then the last piece that's a great transition to Carolyn's work is coaching. Um, you know, 88% uh, of the folks we serve are first time college. 62% uh, of them are female. 54% of them are learners of color. And 51% are parents. Figuring out how to go back to college when job and family are number one and number two in your life and school needs to be number three, you need somebody who's gone to college before, who's done a certificate, who's learned online, who's moved into a salary job. You need somebody on speed dial. And if you're one of our learners, that's not mom and dad. And so having a coach and having that support, everyone we work with wants to learn and grow. That 83% of frontline Americans say that's the number one thing they want from their company. Not pay. They want to grow. They want to know they can grow. And so that, that'd be the transition point. And then we hand 
Her name's Maria, yeah. and then we hand and her to Carolyn. Over. So take her over. Um, well, I think one of the reasons that um, we decided is we were thinking about how do we get more women into positions of leadership, why we started at the VP and C level was just getting more of them into true positions of decision making where they were changing the policies in their companies. Because um, even if you get them, get frontline workers into a place where they are now progressing in their careers, for women in particular, there's a massive drop off that happens uh, at the senior manager director level. It's oftentimes right when you're starting to have a family. Um, and there are, you know, a, a prevalence of leaders right now who are sitting in the C-suite um, making decisions about the policies that they're putting in place for their employees that have, don't really understand those problems from a personal level. And so for us, the idea of just getting more women into those positions of leadership, the ripple effect that that could have across organizations as they put in better policies to support women, as they just are the, you know, um, symbol of what they can be. I mean, you have to see it to be it. Um, and so for us, I think the mantle that we really try to pick up is as somebody has progressed and they've done that um, initial training, they're on, their, they're on the corporate ladder, how do you make sure that they don't fall off? Um, and it's definitely on the individual coaching, sure, but I also think it's really imperative for there to be the equal representation in those senior leadership positions that is thinking about all of the policies of, of the people that are in their workforce and making sure that drop off doesn't happen between the you know, time of, of guilds to the time of chief. Um, and that's the time where you see the, the biggest drop off. You know? Yeah, whether it's drop off or dropouts, um, I want to double click on what you were saying, Rachel, earlier about kind of our education and training system, which is entirely broken. Not only are the community colleges or even four year colleges not really delivering skills that um, can launch graduates into economic security, jobs that can grow, um, many people start college, take on debt, and actually never finish with a degree. Uh, and even those who finish with a degree, many of them are, um, with, they have unemployable skills, and therefore 41% of actually four-year college graduates are underemployed, meaning that they didn't actually need to go to college to have that job. And all the while, people take on debt, and no less, there's $1.7 trillion of student debt held by 43 uh, million Americans. So the equation is just simply not working. We have to rethink who pays for education, and we can debate a lot whether the employer should pay, how we should leverage government uh, funding much more effectively on outcomes. If you think about how government funds uh, programs, the Pell Grants, you know, if you're eligible for it, you just go to college, but it's, the colleges get paid based on enrollment, based on seat time, not whether someone actually gets skills to be launched into the world, right? It's never about outcomes. And then finally, um, how do we hold um, the schools accountable? Um, and how do we hold employers accountable? And how do we take that risk away from individuals so that they don't actually have to take on debt? These are people least able to take on that risk and then pass that risk on to other players who are more equipped to do so. So these are the questions that we're exploring in, in the world of talent finance and workforce finance and, um, and, and with programs like Gill to think through how to usher someone through this journey is incredibly exciting. So. You guys have been at this seven years, three years. What, what has surprised you on this journey? What has it? You want to go first? I'll <laughs> I think almost said that exact list. phrase of like, <laughs> what hasn't? I mean, I think that this is, um, you know, I was talking to our chief people officer, a bunch of chief people officers. I think that this has truly been like the world Olympics of people organizations. Like, I don't think more had, could happen in, the, in what companies have had to navigate in terms of supporting their employees. Um, and so I think for me, the thing that has been most surprising has been um, the speed at which companies need to move now, um, that literally next week there could be something that happens that we don't have a playbook for. And it's why something like Chief over the last three years has been incredibly important because there isn't a playbook for so much of what we have been trying to navigate through and the best playbook is one that can be co-created instantly through a community, uh, which is what Chief can really provide. It's what things like a session like this can provide or um, you know, the whole festival of being able to just share and learn ideas. And so I think for me, the biggest um, surprise has just been the speed with which everybody has to pivot right now. And I don't know that that's going to change. 
we're going to come to you for questions, by the way. So start thinking. Uh, <laughs> um, I have so many, but I, I think um, on the external side, what has uh, surprised me most because uh, we work, we, we think about ourselves as working on behalf of the 100 million Americans who need to go back to school or be reskilled or upskilled in some way before they reach retirement age. And that's two thirds of American workforce. Like it's so broad, it's so diverse. And yet the commonalities of what our employees that we represent want is actually so streamlined and mm. so similar uh, and so common amongst every population, whether that's you know, a cashier at Walmart or a contact center worker at JP Morgan or somebody in the, you know, uh, factory at Tyson. And it's, uh, what we found is it's three things. The first won't surprise you. Employees want pay. And we've actually seen a meaningful increase, right? Um, more wage increases over the last 40 years in the last four quarters of 21. Doesn't mean it's totally caught up with inflation of the last 40 years, but meaningful increase. The second is purpose, and I think that probably doesn't surprise many people here, but I think that has caught lots of companies on their heels. Um, the frontline worker cares about purpose just as much as the corporate worker. They may not be on Slack telling the CEO <laughs> how much they care, but they care. Um, some companies naturally have purpose, others build it. Um, I think Target's a great example of a company who's built a lot of purpose into their values and their employees really feel it. But the third and the interesting one is employees want pathways. And I think it's a, um, it might be uniquely human, but as somebody who's spent most of my career working in the U US and in politics and in startups, it's a, I think there is a uniquely American desire for hope. And we talk a lot about opportunity being the top thing employees want. They don't want a guaranteed promotion. They actually don't like that idea at all because they don't want to be treated equally against all their peers. They want to be differentiated but the ambitious low-income Americans who want to grow, who want to have a family-sustaining wage, and want to live in the middle class, they want, most of all, the opportunity to grow. And I, we both use that word opportunity quite a bit today, but I think that is the defining characteristic that companies are really just figuring out. Mm -hmm. Pay, purpose, Growth. Pathways, if you like. Pathways. Opinions, but yes, growth. <laughs> I like that. PPP. Thank you, Rachel. Natalie came up with that, actually. She's I, I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, I am moving to you if people have questions. And I think we have a mic to here in the front. Thank you. And do introduce yourself. Sure. Hi. Thanks so much for having us here. Um, Anne Perrin with Tomasic. We're a global investment firm. Um, and I'm out of Washington and I run their, their office there. So my question is, um, so there's a bunch of key economists out there that are speaking about what a potential recession would look like in the United States. Jan Hatsus, Ben Bernanke, they're all estimating somewhere between 30 to 50% that we'll have a recession in the next couple years. When you forecast, or excuse me, when you think about historically and you look back to like the global financial crisis and who was primarily affected by that in the workforce and, and what it looked like, lower income, women, minorities, these are people that really got definitely left behind when we were coming back from the GFC. So as companies look at their balance sheets and they think and forecast for the next year, looking at potentially tightening themselves, how does that affect the work you're doing particularly, I would think, at the Guild and how you kind of forecast for that and plan for that and think about that and talk to the companies and make sure that they're, we're hopefully learning some of our lessons from the past? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, I'll start with, if, if I had the crystal ball, I'd work at the Fed, um, not for Guild. But my, um, my gut is that this recession might have some different contours to it than previous. And uh, to give an example, the United States has never entered a recession with a labor shortage. All of our recessions have been entered with already labor surplus. Now, if it takes three years for this recession to manifest, maybe we are in a labor surplus by the time that happens. But if it started you know, in August, it would look quite differently because there is still a pretty meaningful labor shortage. And we talk about the 11 million jobs, but to put a fine point on it, most of them are in high skilled and low skilled. We've talked about the middle skills gap for a long time. It is real, it is pervasive. It's in specific places like people management and project management. But when I see companies talking about the changes they're going to make here, I actually fear that the investment layer that'll be hollowed out are actually the women that we both care a lot about, but Guild is pu 
pushing people into, which is that mid-management. Um, and that's because so much of the day-to-day -day work that these companies rely on, recession or not, sits in that front line, whereas a lot of the innovation, the R&D, the nice-to-haves, not need-to-haves, sit in the middle management. So that's my really cracked crystal ball analysis for right now. I think beyond that, I mean, obviously we're worried. It will be not great for the United States or for the American worker if uh, employers pull back. That said, um, we actually think the federal government is leaning in to fund more, and our model is designed to be agnostic as to the payer, so long as it's not the learner taking on debt. Exactly. And so I'm encouraged by the federal conversations that are uniquely bipartisan, or else is that happening right now, and the state conversations that are uniformly bipartisan about investing more in workforce training. And so that's where, for Guild, that's how we'll meet our mission. Um, if employers are not willing in five years from now to be as generous as we've seen them be for the last seven years. But I think that's a, a pretty low probability scenario. Um, I'm going to move over here with the mic, but um, I think it's an excellent question. And just to double click on one other aspect, which is that we might see sustained labor shortages because of the broader geopolitical environment. Um, if we have to onshore a lot of the supply chain because US-China relations are only getting worse before they get even worse, um, I think that's one impact. I'm an immigrant myself. I grew up in, the, up in that part of the world, and I feel this tension. And then um, unresolved immigration policy also puts a lot of pressure on the labor market. So maybe we hate both of those things, but maybe this is the silver lining. Question over here. I've really enjoyed everything that you've shared, first off. Thank you. I'm curious to understand what role, you know, you met, so my wife, she manages me, my son, her <laughs> job, and everything else. It's, it's pretty intense, and, uh, you know, I, I have the world's respect for what women pull off uh, while pulling off their careers. Um, you know, I, I thought f feminism is about equality. I really think there should, it should, there should be another word uh, for, for recognizing what, what women do. Uh, but coming back to one of the things you mentioned was, you know, education is the third job that we're now putting on people's plates. What role do you see personalized education playing in the efficiency with which learning can happen? And who do you see is doing a good job with delivering personalized, efficient education? That's a great question. Um, today, you know, uh, the bachelor's degree, which by the way, I don't know if Peter Thiel's here, but he's wrong. Uh, the bachelor's degree is not dead yet, actually. It's the most important thing a low-income American can earn in order to move into the middle class. Now, that might shift into another package, um, but education still matters tremendously. The problem with the bachelor's degree is it was defined in the 1920s by Carnegie, the Carnegie unit, and it said, here's how many hours you have to put your butt in a seat, that's what we say in higher ed, it's very sophisticated, in order to earn your degree, 120 credits. That's a real problem. So my answer to what I think is really going to help the, you know, for us, the mid-30s single woman of color who's raising children, what's going to help her is competency-based education, a way for her to demonstrate, here are the, all the skills I've already accumulated on my job. One, that matters, because why do we give wealthy 18-year-olds AP credits when they walk into college, but we deny such strong, smart 35-year-old women the same ability to demonstrate what they've learned over a 15-year career, right? So we have to change that. And then we have to personalize on the back end, helping her learn what she needs to learn, but not making her relearn the things she already learned. And so we're deeply proud to be partnered with some of the most innovative organizations doing competency-based education, but there are still deep regulatory hurdles, and many competency-based programs are still not eligible for Pell Grants, which then holds people back from innovating in the space when they're not you know, available for the large fund that makes higher ed run. So we've got some real challenges to overcome to actually enable personalized education for the higher ed learner. I think in general, like just the um, one silver lining of the pandemic is how much it had to enforce people to really think about the democratization of access for education, that like technology actually has to be at the forefront of the way that people can actually get access to that. And, even at Chief, we were a very in-person organization that then had to pivot over into a virtual way of this community coming together. 
and the engagement of being able to have access to all of this from wherever you are, because you often are, like our members are kind of the movie trope of the busy woman, of like, yeah. how do you have time for this additional thing? <laughs> and so I do think that um, technology getting really deep into the education space really opens up that democratization of access in such, a, in such a, an important, important way, and I hope that really continues. Excellent. Over here, and I'm gonna have both of your questions, and then Rachel and Carolyn can answer together. Thank you so much. Fantastic work. You ladies are killing it. I'm really, really impressed. Um, I'm Nancy Spears. I own Gen Connect You, and we build learning and development for women um, globally, and now pivoting into just D and I, D E I, and uh, B belonging. So I have three questions, um, kind of all in related to what you were just um, talking about around the pandemic. Um, what percentage of shift did you see to online learning and um, is that here for to stay? Secondly, um, how much of the motivation is around learning versus getting the certificate to advance their careers? And then I think thirdly, just um, the uh, completion rates on the, on the e-learning versus a longer program like six months. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, online. Um, uh, we already were primarily online in the students we served, but I think it's important to break apart college of what is the product. Um, college as a product for an 18 year old is a coming of age experience. They want to live on the dorms, they want to go to the football games, maybe they want to go to the frat party and they want to really come of age with their peers. That is an iconic American experience, though it's not particularly democratized and not particularly scalable at $60,000 a year. The learner we serve, the adult working learner, she wants skills. She has a community. That's not what she's hiring college for. Um, she doesn't want to commute back and forth. And the you know, misnomer of community college is there's not a lot of community there. We need to help our community colleges rebuild that. But it's not there. She wants to learn online after her kids go to bed. And so for her, online learning was already the answer. What happened is access exploded. There were 300 good schools online pre-pandemic. Almost all of the 7,000 schools are now trying to go online because they did for the pandemic. That's a good and a bad thing because we don't need 7,000 schools online. So it's happening uh, at a rapid pace. Um, and I don't think Harvard is going to put the freshman experience online. But I think the vast majority of learning for the adult learner will go online and will be synchronous with community and with classmates. I do think that there is a, there is a challenge there. And even though they might have a community, is it actually the community that's gonna to continue to open up more opportunity for them? Um, and so I do think that um, one of the things that has been really important to us is how do you actually create that community at the same time as the learning is happening? Um, there is a uh, study out of Northwestern University that talks about what is the uh, most consistent underlying element for successful women, and it is their, connect, uh, their community of other women. Um, and so I do think as much as uh, we, we play in, in kind of different pockets of, of learning, um, but I think it's really important that even as more of this goes online, that people are really aware of the fact that um, opportunities out past the point that you got all that learning is the network that you created as you were doing that learning and the opportunities that that's going to continue to open up for you. So how do you bring those two things together through technology is, a, is I think, the biggest next challenge. We have a question here, but um, I also have one from, from the digital community. Uh, this person asks, I went to community college after undergrad, going back to your comment, um, Rachel. It got me the job that I wanted. How can we change the narrative of what alternative education paths can offer? Because the vast majority of Americans go through the community college system. The iconic uh, residential ex four-year experience is actually a, a small fraction of people who go to college. Yeah, I think it's a, a brilliant question. Um, one, I think we have to actually stop just using the word college. I, 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 we talked about this in the... Uh, conversation in advance of this, but you know, there's this great. Are companies going to say we don't require college degrees? Are they saying they're relinquishing that? Fine, either way. But what about skills? What skills do I need to work at your company? What skills do I need to have that job? And we should be much more clear about the many alternative paths: certificates, credentials, shorter degrees, etc., where I can earn the skills, or anyone can earn the skills to go be employed. And companies need to be a lot more explicit about that. We're not going to solve that with press releases that say, we no longer require a college degree to apply here. Because when you go ask those companies, well, how many people did you actually 
higher without the degree. It's not that high. And then when you say, and what did you do to support them after they got there? Because they probably had the technical skills, but did they have everything else? They say, oh, good question. So we need to fix all of those things. Um, the other thing is we just need to diversify the narrative about uh, where you learn. You learn in the classroom, you learn on the job, you learn with your families, you learn on the evenings and weekends, and it can't be that there's a monopoly that if you're not in a classroom, you're not learning. We really need to validate all learning, and employers are actually really aligned with that, so I think they can put a lot of pressure on the traditional higher ed narrative. Not to mention the supportive services needed for the community college population, because yeah. life happens. You need help with transportation, rent, childcare, you name it. You. Hi, uh, thank you for this conversation. My name is Fatu, and I work for the National Women's Law Center in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'm trying to see how to frame this question in a way that makes sense. Um, as I think about, uh, especially for you, Rachel, all the things that you mentioned, I, I, um, thinking about the, no, on this, knowing that companies like Chipotle and like the Mini Like It rely on frontline workers and the wages that they pay them that is layered in so many different inter intersectionalities because it has to make the profit, you need to be paying them at this certain wage, right? So my question is more on how are you thinking about truly breaking the intergenerational poverty that often those frontline workers are in so that it's not a revolving door, right? You promote somebody else to the next level and then you have another frontline worker coming through. Um, I don't know if that made any sense, but that's my question. Yeah, um, it's an important question and it makes me sometimes wish I worked in Washington versus in my job because we can attack it from one angle and from Guild's vantage point, we hold ourselves accountable to two things. How many folks are we giving access to education of all sorts? And then what economic mobility is following from that access? To Tracy's point, I don't believe we should measure schools on completion. I think completion's an input. I think economic mobility and the jobs that they get afterwards are the output. And I think we were uncomfortable with that conversation because of the love of the liberal arts narrative. And again, for the small population of Americans hiring college for a coming of age experience, Cool, let's not measure the immediate economic gains of the 22-year-old, but for the 95% of Americans who are going to school as working adults, that's what they're hiring college for, is economic mobility. Um, so that's what we're, we are able to hold ourselves accountable to those two things. I think your question gets at a much larger systemic issue, which is do we believe the base pay rates that even though they've grown over the last um, year, do we believe those are appropriate to be the entry-level wage in America? And with a minute left, I won't try that, but let's like have coffee sometime. Because it's, yeah, it's a really big issue. So with a minute left, I have the perfect question from the space out there for both of you to wrap this wonderful session. What is your 10, 20 year vision for each of your companies? Carolyn. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that we um, are, we're on a mission to change the face of leadership, which for us is, uh, twofold. It is representation in senior leadership. It is making sure that we have more women, more people of color that are in those positions. But it's also making sure that when they get in those positions, they are the best leaders that they can be. And for us, we started in um, we started with senior executive women, uh, but there is a much broader, much longer uh, challenge of trying to get underrepresented communities into those positions of leadership. So I think over time. While we're focused first on senior executives, um, I'm really excited about how we can continue to tackle the multiple points of time. Not going to frontline workers, so we will not be competing together. We'll partner. <laughs> we'll partner. We will truly have the, how does one graduate from We're gonna put to the chief. escalator <laughs> yeah. up. Um, but I think it's continuing to explore those different levels of how we can ensure that that upper mobility really exists for underrepresented communities. And ours is not uh, too distinct. I think we really will hopefully build an escalator for talent. Um, but we want to be the platform for the emerging middle class. And we believe education is the necessary but not wholly sufficient ingredient to do that. And so we are constantly thinking about how to build the ecosystem of product, services, and supports that help every low-income American have the opportunity 
to advance into a middle class and into a family sustaining wage? And then what are all the additional things that you need to help support them when they get there? Um, whether that's making sure that they're uh, accessibly banked, whether that's making sure they're not taking on debt in other places, childcare, all of those things. So um, Guild's not gonna build that all ourselves. Um, and we hopefully are gonna send a lot of people to Chief, um, but really making sure that that pathway, that American dream is back to being the rule, not the exception. Well, thank you, both of you, for inspiring us, for <laughs> rethinking the needs of the modern workforce, for resuscitating the American dream. You guys are two extraordinary entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.